Can I ask you a couple of questions yeah, about go? Can I ask you some questions about Mohammed? Can you get out, please? I just wanted to know whether can you, you get out, please? whether you'd known can you get out, that please? he'd gone to Syria. Can you get out, please? In Libya. Get out. Did you know that out. This is his son Mohammed Abdallah. One minute he was working in a supermarket, the next he was on his way to the Libyan uprising. He ended up fighting for the Islamic State as a sniper. These young men, you know, who are coming to them from the West, you know, are perfect tools to try to launch attacks back against uh, the United Kingdom. We've tried to find out why he chose that path in life and who helped him along the way. There was extremist views cultivated not on the streets of Tripoli, but actually on the streets of Manchester. The extremist views are more in Manchester than in Tripoli. His conviction for being part of the Islamic State was based on documents obtained by Sky News and used in evidence to a jury. The file itself uh, and being able to attribute that to Mohammed Abdullah was a really important piece of evidence for us. It shows that Mohammed Abdallah is the latest name to be added to a growing terror cell that we've uncovered. I think this particular network is fascinating. And for the first time we can link Mohammed Abdallah with the Manchester bomber, Salman Abedi. Their childhoods, their home lives, their fathers, remarkably similar. In this special report, we look at the friendship between these two young men who grew up together and ask, why did one become a mass murderer and the other a convicted terrorist? So I think as we see the kind of flames of the Arab Spring spread around the Middle East and in particular touch upon Libya, you start to see a sort of uprising develop. Gaddafi was sort of a long, much hated uh, leader of the country. And there was a large population of dissidents who had fought him both politically and militarily. Colonel Gaddafi uh, started to talk about exterminating uh, entire sort of villages of the rebels and it looked like the rebellion was potentially about to be crushed. There was a push by then Prime Minister Cameron and uh, President um, Sarkozy to actually go and do something about this. And they really mobilized the sort of force to actually go back and start to provide some support for the revolutionaries on the ground. The latest information is that the vast majority of Tripoli is now controlled by free Libyan forces. And amongst this community, it of course included a number of British nationals who lived here in the United Kingdom, who, you know, had continued to sort of struggle in their own way against, uh, against Gaddafi. And you really start to see the Gaddafi regime start to crumble. And ultimately, this led to um, his death uh, in a ditch um, on the roads of Libya. They would be celebrating for months, but it would be several years before Britain felt the shockwaves of what happened here. Mohammed Abdallah returned from the Libyan uprising to the family home in Manchester in 2011. When they were fighting alongside others during the uprising, you know, they, they were part of a band of brothers. There was a real sense of community. They've returned to Manchester and they perceive themselves likely as being nobodies anymore. This likely led to a, a kind of hole that needed to be filled. Mohammed had a younger brother called Abd al Rauf. His revolution didn't go so well. He was paralysed during the fighting and came home in a wheelchair. The Abdallah family had settled into a growing Libyan community in Manchester, having been granted asylum a decade earlier. At his son's trial, the court heard how their father, Naga, had strong links to a well-known band of militants 
called the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. So the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, uh, they were formed by veterans uh, fighting against the Soviet invasion in Afghanistan in the 1980s. However, in 2004, they were prescribed as a terrorist group by the UK and others because of their perceived uh, alleged connection to Al-Qaeda. His dad was also a member of the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. The group later renounced their links to Al-Qaeda and condemned the targeting of Westerners, eventually disbanding in 2010. Manchester was the perfect uh, place to many Libyans who claim asylum, who came for study, who came to work. Some, some of them call them Little Tripoli because... It's Rita Felboom spent 10 years in Manchester and taught the Abdallah brothers. He now lives in Libya. He knew the Abdallahs very well. The British government at that time wanted Dhabi to, uh, to go by any price. So they helped the revolutionaries and some of those revolutionaries were British Libyan citizens. Probably they didn't, didn't uh, did the good study of what's the consequences for those British citizens who carry weapons and came back to the UK. Three years after he fought in Libya, in the summer of 2014, Mohammed Abdallah decided to leave Manchester again. He took a flight to Tunisia, onwards to Istanbul, and crossed the border into Syria, where he joined the Islamic State. In court, the jury heard how Mohammed's father withdrew £2,000 and sent his son the cash by telegram to a hotel on the Turkey-Syria border. Mohammed then used the money, the jury was told, to purchase an automatic weapon. He denied that during his trial, saying the money was used for flights, but the jury didn't believe that. This is the form Mohammed Abdallah filled out when he joined IS. It was part of a haul of documents obtained exclusively by Sky News. When he signed up, he put his occupation down as supermarket assistant but his ambition was to be a sniper. This document was used to help convict him. The UK believes more than a thousand extremists have left Britain to fight overseas. The fear that if they return, they could use their terror training to carry out an attack here. In May 2017, that's exactly what happened. The murder of 22 people at the Manchester Arena was the worst terrorist attack in Britain since the London bombings of 2005. The bomber was a young man called Salman Abedi. Abedi and Mohammed Abdallah have a lot in common, having both grown up in Manchester's Little Tripoli. Mohammed's father was part of the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. Salman Abedi's father was a senior figure in that same group. He was involved in this group called the LIFG, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. He was very much an active member in that he was a fighter as part of this group. They'd struggled against Gaddafi and he was very much part of the kind of distant community that was based here in the United Kingdom. The, the British authority knows, I mean, uh, knows the, uh, the, the, uh, the father and other members who came from Afghanistan. The British security services knew more about the Abadi family than they were willing to let on in the aftermath of the bombing. Well, we do know that he was known up to a point to the intelligence services. I'm sure we'll get more information about him over the next few days um, and over the next few weeks. But I would just point out that... When you say known, what does that mean? Well, I can't be drawn on that at the moment because it is an ongoing investigation. MI5 regarded Abidi as a threat well before the Manchester attack. He was a so-called subject of interest but that had been downgraded 
suggesting he wasn't thought to be an imminent threat when he detonated his device. Given the nature of the attack that he subsequently took place, it would seem as though it was quite clear that he came back with a very specific deadly intent. Salman Abedi was part of a terror cell in Manchester. At the heart of that cell was Raphael Hosti, Britain's most prolific Islamic State recruiter. Hosti persuaded many of his friends from Moss side to join him. He recruited Mohammed and Abdal Rauf Abdallah to follow in the same path. All in all, they became a deadly band of brothers. We now know that Salman Abedi and the Abdallah brothers were in fact good friends. They all prayed together at this Islamic center in Manchester and the people there remember them. Uh, this yeah, this coming, is coming yeah. here, spraying he only praying. Friday. Yeah, on Fridays. In Friday on Friday, he was coming here, yeah, praying. In the wheelchair, yes, the wheelchair. he was in a wheelchair. And he's yeah, sitting yeah. here. He, sits, he yeah, sat at yeah. the back here. Yeah. Yeah. This young man here is Salman Abedi. You might know him as... Yes, and this one is coming time, time. It's he's, not, it's he, not in the Friday. He comes, uh, he comes a lot. Time. Yeah. Friday. Do you remember seeing him here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. It was a really interesting chat with these two men. Uh, they confirmed to me that Abdel Rauf Abdallah used to come here, but also at the same time, Salman Abedi, the Manchester bomber, used to come here too. In fact, we know that Salman Abedi used to push his friend in his wheelchair and just park him up at the back there. It's clearly been devastating for these men in this mosque to discover uh, how those lives ended up and the decisions that those young men took. It's unclear how Abidi and Abdallah were radicalised. When Mohammed Abdallah gave evidence at his trial, he said he wanted to fight in Libya because his father also wanted to fight. Experts believe that the radicalisation could have occurred through exposure to warfare. It was no wonder that that compounded with the fact that both of these lads had been to Libya and been exposed to conflict and warfare would have turned out that way and were vulnerable to radicalization to ISIS. When Sky News made public the details of the files, security services were made aware of Mohammed Abdallah's involvement within IS. When he tried to re-enter the UK in September 2016, he was arrested and charged. He said he joined the Islamic State by accident said he tried to leave within just four weeks, but he actually stayed in Syria for nearly two years. He now joins his brother Abdel Rauf in prison. He was jailed last year for sending money to jihadis in Syria. People make their own choice in life and I don't understand you know, all the influences uh, on those two brothers and why they made those choices. I'm sure it must be very difficult for the family um, to understand why they would want to get involved uh, in this conflict. I wanted to ask their father how he felt now that his two sons were convicted terrorists and why he sent his son £2,000 as he made his way to Syria. Can I ask you a couple of questions yeah, about... Can I ask you some questions about Mohammed? Can you get out, please? I just wanted to know whether, you, get out, whether you'd known can you get out, that please? he'd gone to Syria can you get out, please? in Libya. Get out. Did you know that out. he... I just want to. Out, I just please. want to know whether you out. knew whether he'd gone. Out. Did you know he was going to Get Libya? Out. Did you know he was going Get to out. Syria? We just want to ask some questions. That's all. Out. Don't go there. I took you here. Yeah? Don't talk to me. Yeah? Well, I just, Get out. I just want to ask you one Get or two out. questions. Did you know Salman Abedi? Get out. We don't have any son there. Get out. You have a son called Mohammed. We don't have any son there. I don't know. Okay. We don't have. I'm not going to see. Go back. Well, why do you... There's an interesting parallel between both of those young men, isn't there? It's a fascinating parallel and I think it's a real um, example of, in some ways, the difficulties that you have with these kind of generational uh, struggles. One of the big tragedies here is that someone would want to go on to commit an act of terror against their own community. And now we need to think about why that might be the case. 
Now, it's not just about foreign policy in as much as people might want to point to that, but also what's happening domestically. So it's no surprise that these conditions were the perfect conditions to create a world in which that was allowed to happen. I think yes, I think if you look at all the ingredients that you see on the ground, it's in many ways no surprise that we saw happen uh, what ultimately happened.